Newsflash, you are so much more than what you do. Hey everyone, how's it going? I'm Kira Wackett. Thanks for joining me for another video as we work to empower and equip you with the confidence and skills to write your own story so that you can live a life on purpose. In this episode, we're gonna be talking about the way we view ourselves, either from a content or a context-driven platform. We'll be looking into the limiting and shame-inducing viewpoint a self as content model can bring to the scene and what shifting to a self as context model can do to deepen our understanding of ourselves and the way we show up in the world. From the time we're born, we're indoctrinated with messages that suggest that what we do is of greater importance and value than who we are. Social capital is founded on the values of a hustle culture. You carry your metaphorical resume, your skills, accomplishments, roles, with you in every situation, mastering the art of the humble brag as a desperate attempt to climb the rungs of a ladder to the land of worthy and valuable. This is content-driven living, or more simply put, seeing the self as content. We boil our lives down to a to-do list and overpacked schedules, constantly on the hunt to add more to our overflowing plates. And when we inevitably drop the plate or find we can't do it all, we skew the storyline to read as though we failed. We are the problem. We internalize responsibility for everything, reading the experience through a lens of self as failure. You can already see how this worldview can be limiting and distressing. You see your entire role in life as needing to manage it all, do it all, without fail. You are responsible for everything and play the role of the hero, and the villain. The more we engage with these beliefs, the easier it is to turn each failure or misstep into a character assassination. X didn't happen because I was lazy or didn't work hard enough. My kid got hurt because I'm an irresponsible parent. I didn't get into X college because I'm not smart enough. Or I wasn't selected for this art exhibit because I'm not a talented artist. This person ghosted me because my body's gross or I'm not thin enough or I did something wrong. The two most common phrases that I hear when someone is stuck in content-driven narrative is, I am not blank enough, and I should be able to, or should have been able to do blank. And sure, in some cases, life may be that simple. X leads to Y, no other solution or alternative. But these cases are highly controlled scientific experiments where every other variable has been eliminated. The context of the experience has been reduced to only see if X leads to Y. Living has literally been removed from the circumstances to get to this answer. But the human experience is not that simple. And we alone can't be responsible for everything that does or does not happen. You can't see one experience or situation in isolation, removing it from the context of your life as a whole and see only one solution. What else may have contributed to an outcome? Sure, maybe you didn't get the job you wanted, but is it because you're not qualified or because you failed? Or might it be that someone else's experiences were a better fit for the team? Might it be because you were overqualified or because of biases and assumptions made by the hiring committee? And let's even go deeper. Could it be because you didn't really want it and that came through in the interview? Or perhaps you don't have the skills yet, but not because you're lazy, but because you spent years being a caregiver to your aging parent and you were unable to pursue the educational training that you needed to advance your field until now. Let's talk about being ghosted. Can we absolutely positively assume it's because of your body or what you look like? What if they realize they weren't ready for a relationship? What if they decided to give it a go with an ex? What if they found a greater connection and chemistry with someone else? What if they're so scared of conflict and didn't want to hurt your feelings, so rather than call you and tell you any of this, they decided just to avoid it? And let's not forget another key possibility. What if they're just a jerk? You can see that in both of these examples, playing the what-if game allows us to build context possibilities. 
even more so as you do this within your own examples, we can go way beyond context as a possibility and instead dive deeper into context as actuality. Let's consider the working mom who recently got divorced and is struggling to make ends meet. She's been forgetting things lately and feeling like she's constantly failing with her kids, at her job, in every part of her life. She's struggling to make sense of her divorce and worries about the effect on her kids. She's navigating how to be there for them with the change and support and home life while also dealing with an aging parent. She forgets to take the trash out one night and then realizes the next morning that she missed trash pickup this week and the trash cans are overflowing. Immediately, she tells herself, "Ugh, I'm so disorganized. I can't believe that I just, I keep messing up. I need to get it together. Self as content would suggest she's a failure. She is responsible for all things and therefore the problem when anything doesn't work out. She should have remembered the trash. Self in context would suggest that in fact, she's doing a great job managing so many new changes in her life and trying to process the intensity of her emotions and still show up in each of her different roles. Self as context might say that as these changes have occurred, a spotlight has been put on to highlight some of the areas or zones in which she could use some more support. Perhaps learn how to ask for help or delegate or develop some systems to track her tasks so that she's not holding all of this in her head when her brain is trying to do so much during such a big time of change. The shift when we see her in the context of her life is we can move away from saying, she's failing, or in her words, I'm the problem, to I feel like I'm failing, or even I'm having a problem right now. It allows for greater depth of an experience rather than forcing her into a small range or window of perfection-driven living. We can see that some times are going to be harder than others, and there may be times she gets it wrong or misses things, but when we allow the context of her life to come into play, we can create space for self-love and compassion and shift to see our lives less from a place of judgment and more from a place of curiosity, rather than what am I doing wrong, thinking, what am I missing or what do I need? Instead of blaming the self, we explore what might be contributing to X and shift away from helplessness and negative self-evaluation to a space of empowerment and action. One of my favorite tools to support you in making this shift is Byron Katie's four question tool set called The Work, which I'm gonna post a link to in the notes below. These questions are designed to help us combat destructive and limiting thoughts about ourselves and about the world and people around us. Whenever we make a bold self as content statement, such as I'm a failure, or I'm not a good parent, or I'm gonna lose my job, ask yourself these four questions. One, is it true? And most of us are gonna have an immediate reaction of yes, of course it's true. We can't even entertain another solution because we've founded our belief system so strongly on needing to do and be it all at all times. So then you move to question two. Can we absolutely, positively know that this is true? In this case, I ask patients to consider if they can make a case that no one can poke a hole in to support their conclusion. Meaning you have decided it's true, but is it a fact? an undeniable fact. This is the point where the hesitation starts to come in because the reality is these negative self-evaluations are often subjective truths rather than objective facts. Now, number three, which is my favorite question, who do I become when I believe this thought to be true? This question literally asks you to expand this thought into the overall context of your life. If you believe you're a failure, how does that show up in your team meetings? How does it affect your engagement with your kids? Or at the end of the day, when you inevitably have items left on your to-do list, how does that change the way you view yourself? And finally, who would I be if I let this thought go? The idea here is that we can shift into thinking about the thought as an assessment of the self rooted in shame. 
Then we look at all the ways that it affects us in our daily lives. And we start to really build an understanding about how it kind of narrows our vision and makes us pretty tunnel vision to only see ourselves again as needing to fix it all, do it all, be the hero, and yet the problem in everything that's happening. And then when we get to question four, we can look at how would my life be different if I let that go? And that helps us build that motivation, that hope, that excitement that if I let that go, if I allowed the possibility of the context of my life being a factor in the story that I'm writing, maybe I might engage differently in these settings. Maybe in fact, I'd feel like I'm doing better in my role as a parent or in my job or managing all the things that I have going on. Maybe I'd feel less reactive. Maybe I'd feel less pressure. Maybe feeling like I want to take care of myself wouldn't feel like it's such a luxury, but instead something that I know I have the right to choose, rather than beating myself up about all the things that I have to do before I have the right to relax. Now it's your turn. I want you to consider the role in which the notion of self as content has been affecting the way that you view yourself and your connection to the world around you. Where have you been drawing biased conclusions? What shoulds, supposed tos, judgments, negative self-evaluations have you had as a result of this oversimplified narrative? Consider the context. Develop the entire plot line and give greater depth to your story. What changes? What possibilities are there beyond these conclusions? And how might we use Byron Katie's The Work to help us in letting this go? As always, I love to hear from and support you in your journey to living a life on purpose. And we know connection and communication are two of our greatest weapons against shame and negative self-talk. So comment below with the thoughts that have been holding you back and the content that you've gotten stuck in for years and the ways that you can begin to dismantle that and build context for the greater narrative. If you like what you're hearing, be sure to subscribe and save yourself the time and energy of having to check back for content and get an alert whenever there's new awesomeness to watch. And if you want to stay in the know on all of the happenings of Adversity Rising, plus get exclusive content and specials that I don't share anywhere else, subscribe to my email list by following the link in the notes. I'm so grateful you were all here with me today as we talked about such a powerful and necessary shift in the way that we view ourselves and the story of our lives. Remember, you have the right to author your own story. Build it deep. Provide the depth of your experience, your character, yourself. Allow your story to be full. Grab the pen and make it yours. See you next time.